welcome back to Patent Law Textbooks, a micro symposium. Once again, I'm Jason Rantanen, the David L. Hammer and Willard L. Sandy Boyd Professor and Director of the Iowa Innovation Business and Law Center at the University of Iowa College of Law. In this second panel, we'll hear from casebook authors who have self-published their textbooks using a variety of different platforms. If you've got questions as we go along, please go ahead and type them into the Zoom Q&A tool. I'll try to ask as many as I can. So as a reminder, this program is being recorded and will be made publicly available at the conclusion. All right, so let's go ahead and start by meeting our author panelists. I'll introduce each panelist and then ask them to say a few words about their textbook and how they published it. So our first panelist is Lisa Laramore Willett, Professor of Law and Justin M. Roach, Jr., faculty scholar at Stanford Law School and co-author of Jonathan S. Mazur and Lisa Laramore Willett, Patent Law Cases, Problems, and Materials. Welcome, Lisa. Thanks. Um, so, so I already described the casebook and its problem-focused approach in the first panel. I'm not going to recap that, but just to briefly uh, recap the points that are relevant for this panel. Um, our, our casebook is available for free PDF download on a website, patentcasebook.org. Uh, you can also order a print copy through Amazon, which is priced at cost. Uh, so we're not making any profit from either the PDF or the print version. Uh, for adopters, we have a Word version, a detailed teacher's manual and PowerPoint slides. And we've generally authorized derivative uses such as instructors who want to use the Word version to provide an edited version for their classes. Um, and um, as talked about in our, our initial panel, like one of our main goals here um, was to lower the cost of these materials for students in addition to the kind of substantive goals of bringing additional clarity and having uh, problems for students to actively work through the um, patent doctrines they're learning about. Terrific. Our next panelist is Sarah R. Wasserman Ryak, a professor of law and Eng research professor at the University of William and Mary Law School and co-author of Sarah Burstein, Sarah R. Wasserman Ryak, and Andres Sawicki, Patent Law and Open Access Casebook. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I, en I enjoyed the last panel, but it's nice to nice to be here uh, and, and speaking um, about, about self-publishing a casebook. Uh, so I, I missed some of the very beginning, and I apologize. I had another meeting run late, so I, I hope I'm not. Uh, I hope I'm not uh, repeating things that uh, Sarah Burstein already said. Um, but we we decided to put our casebook out as a free PDF download. Um, it's downloadable from SSRM, and then uh, we also have a, a low cost print version available on Amazon. Um, we I mean we might we might talk a little bit more about process. I think as as the panel goes on. Um, but but sort of we we uh, talked to some people who had done this before, you know, IP professors, our community in general is, is very generous um, with advice. And so we talked to people about about how they had done it, uh, what sort of copyright licensing they used um, and whether whether this was something that that we should do. Um, and they were all very supportive. And I think I, I, that, that's advice I would give to other people that, uh, that if you have a vision of what you wanna put out there and how you wanna put it out there. Um, and if you think it's, it's important to, to self-publish and make it available um, at free or low cost as, as we did and, and, um, and other, others did as well, um, then I, I would say to go for it. Uh, we, we also, I think we have the same copyright license we, we chose as, as Lisa and Jonathan. Um, so we're we're open to derivative works, but we wanted to maintain um, some control, given that our names are on it. Um, but I, you know, we'll we'll talk with anybody who who wants to do things with with it, and and we're we're basically open to that. Um, so that's what makes it open access rather than open source, I guess. Um, and maybe that's something we'll we'll get into a bit more as well as we go along. Um, I think that's all I'll say, just just as the intro, until until we get to more questions. Terrific, thank you. Um, so our next panelist is Ted Sickleman, Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Intellectual Property Law and Markets, the Center for Computation, Mathematics and the Law and the Technology and Entrepreneurship Clinic at the University of San Diego School of Law and co-author and co-executive editor of Mark D. Janis, Ted M. Sickleman et al, Patent Law and Open Source Casebook. Welcome, Ted. Thanks, Jason, and thanks for putting this on. It's really a great, um, 
service to everyone to have all these casebook authors in, in one spot talking about what they're providing and their motivations. So uh, our motivation was to basically get a group of authors who are experts on various subtopics within patent law and have them put together chapters uh, on those topics and particularly draft notes where they had written a lot of articles and had great expertise uh, in particular areas and then make that available uh, in an open source format, truly open source uh, for anyone to use. So what distinguishes open source from open access and free and so forth? Because these terms get bandied about and they're not always defined uh, in any clear fashion. So first off, right, free versus open source are two very different aspects of any book. And I know we'll talk about this later, but it kind of leads into how we published what we did. So you could have a free book from a traditional publisher, or you could have an open source book that costs 200 bucks. Um, the difference uh, between them ultimately is one is relating to cost and the other one relates to whether or not you allow others to use your material. So on our book, anyone can use our material in any way they want with attribution. There's no Creative Commons license that restricts anything. It's just completely, hey, in the front of our book, if you want to use it, go right ahead, however you want to do it, and just provide us attribution. And to do this, we posted it on La Carta, which is part of Live Carta, which maybe I can show a little bit later. But it allows you to essentially mix and match uh, the book itself by rearranging the chapters and pulling in new material and deleting material, as well as mixing it with other books. So if you want to take a chapter from another book and stick it in or take a chapter from our book and stick it into another book, it's very easy to do. So it's truly open source and our book is free as well. So we've posted it on SSRN and we're happy to share the Word version uh, with anyone as well. But that was our motivation in the beginning and that's why we published with La Carta, which allows you to print on demand. So once you've customized it, you can print it to either a hardcover or a soft cover book and have it shipped uh, directly to you or to your students or whoever else. So it's a fully customizable process. Um, and our final panelist is uh, Peter Minnell, the core professor of law and co-director Berkeley Center for Law and Technology at UC Berkeley Law and co-author of Intellectual Property in the New Technological Age with Robert P. Murgis, Mark A. M. Lemley, and uh, Shamkrisha Balganesh. Uh, welcome, Peter. Well, thank you, Jason. And it's nice to see so many friends and colleagues. Uh, our story is a bit different. And I'll say that we're a self-published book. We're not an open source book. We're not free, but we're fair in that we reduced the price of what was a traditionally published book by 80 to 90%. And based on our back of the envelope calculations, we've saved students about a million dollars a year for the last five or six years compared to what had been the sales volumes and uh, of, of our books. Uh, I'll also note that I, published uh, several other books through what's called Clause 8 Publishing, which is just uh, a fictitious big business name that I associate with this effort. And uh, uh, those books are patent treatises uh, that are written for federal judges, but are widely used in patent litigation classes, as well as by federal judges and practitioners. Uh, and the most recent of those books is a patent mediation guide and that uh, is, is uh, co-authored with uh, Kathy Vidal, uh, the, the appointee for the PTO directorship. Uh, those books are available on SSRN and they are free in digital form. They're also available through Amazon uh, at, at, at a little above the cost. Uh, the IP books are published through Amazon, uh, both as print books and Kindle books. And they are uh, modestly priced, but, but they're not free. And in some ways that reflects some of the philosophy that we approach this subject, which is that we think that, that the IP system should, should uh, enable people to earn a, a fair return. What our publisher, uh, initially Little Brown, later Aspen, and then later Walters Kluwer, 
was doing was outrageous. They were charging $250 for a book that cost $10 to manufacture. And in 2012, when we approached them about doing what would have been the seventh edition in September, this picks up on John Duffy's point about how slow these publishers are. They said, you're too late. We would have needed your manuscript by August. In order to bring out a book in May for adoption the following year, and at that point, we pulled out our original contract with Little Brown from 1994, and we saw that we owned the copyright. Uh, Little Brown approached the industry a little differently than Walters Kluwer, and they never, Walters Kluwer never asked us to renegotiate. And so it turns out we owned the copyright. We were only assigning the current edition. And at that point, uh, I, I uh, stepped up and asked Rob and Mark uh, to join me in this effort. And, and they weren't as interested in doing the self-publishing. Uh, I had a curiosity about the publishing industry and tech disruption. So that got me down that, down that path. I'll say it was not easy. And I commend uh, the others who have gone down this path. Uh, we wanted to retain somewhat of a, of a commercial model. And we, we have. We've, we've grown the adoptions uh, over what we were doing before. Uh, and I feel that, that this model gives us a, a good way to more closely work with adopters. Uh, students email us uh, pretty freely about the books. And we also, I think, have a better sense of, of the marketplace. Uh, the big publishers never gave us timely adoption lists and it was just much harder to have that more direct relationship. So, so we've done that. And since we didn't say much, in, in, since the first panel didn't cover this book, I'll say that the uh, volume one, we had to divide the book into two because Amazon's Create Space, now Kindle Direct, uh, has page limits. And so it was decided that we would have two volumes and then we also did a statute book. And that enabled us to create both a patent trade secret book as well as a copyright trademark book. And so both books are used uh, in small, in two or three credit versions of those subjects uh, and then I, and I would say the majority of our users, uh, use both for survey classes. And that gave us an opportunity to, to recast and rethink some of the aspects of the books. And I don't want to repeat what was in the first panel, but I'll say it was our book that, that first moved the 101 issue uh, to the back. Uh, and that grew out of some of the work that I was doing. And I debated with Rob and Mark quite a bit in 2014 doing that. They were, I'll say, not, not as supportive, uh, but then Rob uh, and John later followed that model and, and sounds like others have. And, you know, it's driven by the law. The, the Supreme Court pushed the law in this, I'll say, somewhat surprising direction, uh, not a direction I, I think makes a lot of sense. And you can't teach 101 until you've taught 102, 103, 112. Thanks, Peter. So we're going to talk about a couple of different aspects of self-publishing. I want to start out with the first question, which is why? Why did you create a self-published textbook? What was your, your motivation, your underlying motivation for doing this? Um, I mean, my, my motivation was that like the, the primary motivation, I was increasingly uncomfortable with asking students to pay $200 for a case book um, and also uh, my own sense of the kind of best pedagogic way to present the material was increasingly diverging from existing options. Uh, so I was interested in using my own, um, developing my own material. And in doing that, it seemed like uh, there were a lot of advantages to doing it on my own rather than with a traditional publisher. And I was definitely inspired by other law professors who've done this, uh, including, I think there's a lot of great options in the IP space and uh, copyright and trademark case books that are very well done and um, available during the same like free PDF download and low cost printing from Amazon. So I was definitely inspired by that. Sarah? Yeah, so I think, uh, like like Lisa, I was inspired by our by our colleagues in uh, in copyright and trademark and and uh, Peter's Peter's IP um, course as well. 
Um, and we spoke, also a lot of our IP colleagues have been involved in the property uh, law casebook. Uh, I don't teach property law, but um, we talked to Jeremy Sheff, who is incredibly supportive. Uh, we talked to Jeannie Frommer and Chris Brigman um, and, uh, and seeing, seeing that they had been able to do this. And, and I think also um, now a torts, a torts book as well. Um, so I think I think sort of the IP profs are are on this right, and we're interested in those disruptions, um, as Peter said. Um, and so knowing that that existed everywhere except for patent law, I felt like, well, that's that's a market failure, right? Um, so so here we are um, filling that filling that space of of providing uh, free content. Um, but um, but anyway, so. So yeah, I think I think we we knew that it could be done. We knew that people did it at you know really high quality um, and and produced these and were able to produce uh, case books that that teach like a traditional case book. Um, and then you know there's there's some pleasure too in putting putting your own stamp or figuring out the right way to to shape things and the right way to teach it and and um, bringing in sources that, that you think are sort of interesting but maybe overlooked um, and figuring out figuring out where where to sort of pull back in the context and where you want to drill down and say no you need to understand you know how this how this actually gets decided in in courts and just how factually dependent it is and where you want to um, pull back and say well let's think about how this how this fits in um, to, to patent policy rules more generally um, so that part that part was really fun and appealing um, and the fact that that no one else at that point was doing it um, meant that that it seemed it seemed like why not just uh, jump into that space and and that said it's really nice that now there's there's these options because um, as, as others have said too there is the possibility to mix and match. Um, when when the the cost is not is not a barrier, um, you can think about you know professors can think about which way they want to teach different things or or what works for them, um, and and pull things together uh, that do work for them. And and then also the the cost of casebooks just going up and up. Um, I think I think people you know it's it's hard to ask uh, law students to to pay those kind of prices. And in patent law, you have to have updated books, right? You can't. Um, you can't say, oh, I'll just use, you know, the second edition uh, or use the use the casebook that I learned out of because that thing spent all its time on interferences. Um, and, and, you know, you can't do that now. So you have to teach with with an updated version um, and and the cost just just kept getting higher and higher to a point where it felt like this was this was a good thing, a, a good thing to do for lots of different reasons. Peter. I agree with all of those points, and I just want to, uh, I guess, dovetail with with what John said earlier. I mean, the lag time makes no sense, and you know, we all write articles, put them up on SSRN, and you know, then we'll wait a year for a law review to maybe get it out. Uh, and so, the ability to to finish the Supreme Court term in late June, and we deliver our book, it's available at Amazon uh, by July 15th. So we're already, if there's a Supreme Court decision waiting, you know, an Oracle, Google, or whatever, uh, we can get that into our book. There's no need to have a supplement. Uh, the other thing is this, the supplement, the statutory book that I did, uh, I added a number of features including tabs and other uh, headers that I think make it better than what the traditional publishers are putting out. And, and you know, with that book, you know, we had tremendous amendments to, to the law in the last several years. Every year we have amendments. And so, you know, going in and, and just refreshing that book makes it available and the price is sufficiently low. Uh, as far as the cost, I get emails from students thanking us and saying how much they appreciate owning a law book. And that really surprised me because even though law books were somewhat costly when I was a law student, you know, I, I bought, you had to buy the books. And, and uh, unlike John, I still have them on my shelf, but they're not accessed very much, uh, mostly just decoration. But it just seems to me that you're spending so much on legal education uh, being able to write in a book, and even though our books are available on Kindle and students like using, I feel you absorb information better when you read it and you can write on it. And so to get notes from students just saying how much they appreciate being able to own their books 
is a real testament to how badly the academy has supported our students. I think law school, you know, basically the publishing industry is supported by us. You know, the, the board of directors of all the major publishers are our colleagues. And I'm shocked that they participate in this uh, scheme. It's a scam. I mean, you can't charge $250 for a book. And what people don't realize, they thought my co-authors and I received money. No, we, we earned $15 between all three of us on a $250 book. And, and so even though we make a little, we, we retain that amount. That's the amount we make uh, $750 per book on our, our divided book. And, you know, I, I consider that a fair return. I don't think it's, it's an outrageous amount and it keeps us motivated. Uh, and it is, you know, non-trivial, but it's, it's not what, what supports us. But I just think that that's where we ought to be as part of the legal academy. And I'm glad the IP professors are pushing that, but it would be nicer if we got, you know, more of the institutions to support us as well. Because the publishers are just feeding off of us they are charging so much for books that cost almost nothing. And a lot of it's wasted because they ship books to people who don't use them. They have all these reps. And I just think that the industry needs serious disruption. Thanks, Peter. I, I, I love the ability to be creative in my, my book. I mean, that's one of the things I've, and the fast turnaround. I mean, the fast turnaround, I, for my intro to IP materials, I can put it together and it can be up and ready and on an Amazon for people to buy and like, you know, a couple of days. And that's just, it's just so great. I just love that. Um, Ted, what are your thoughts? So I think these are all excellent points. I agree with you, Peter, that the publishers really are not doing much of a service uh, for our community. I've met with all the three big publishers uh, because I helped start La Carta and we did a big demo for them. And there was very little concern ultimately, um, in my view, beyond maintaining the existing system and the profits that go along with it. I think it's clear they're all making a ton of profit in this industry and that they work hand in hand with one another. And there's no reason, uh, I mean, there's good reason that the prices have maintained uh, at quite a high level and an increasing level over the years. Uh, so, I decided, you know, when I started this project and then brought in Mark uh, a bit thereafter that uh, we, along, you know, with everyone on this panel could provide the same level of value, if not a lot more, which I'll get into uh, by not going with the traditional publishers uh, for either, you know, you're doing it at a low cost or at no cost. Um, the, the additional value ultimately at the end of the day is, right, being able, number one, to update as often as you want. So on the La Carta platform, you can update, you know, every week if you want, basically, of course, if there's a printed book that goes along with it, that's not going to be updated. But if there's a new case in the middle of the semester, you can plop it on there very easily. Mark and I update our book um, before each semester with a major revision in the summer. But if there's a big case coming out, we're going to, of course, put it in before the spring semester. The federal circuit obviously releases important cases all throughout the year and then the PTO and so forth with its internal guidance documents and so forth. Um, the other side of it too is I think as um, Sarah mentioned and what we tried to do with this book is bringing different expertise to bear on different aspects of the book. So I think you know combining variety of problems and, and Mark and I have a number of problems in the book right, with cases and notes from other books would be the best thing we could do. You know, looking at all of the books and then for you as a professor determining, hey, what you wanna teach and what order you wanna teach it in, we shouldn't necessarily, right, have a best way to teach 101. Some professors may wanna teach it in a different way depending upon their students, right? There's no correct way to do this because everyone has different types of students. Most of my students in patent law are bio students with PhDs who want to become patent prosecutors. That will be a very different type of course than someone who, you know, is at Columbia or whatnot teaching people who are going to do patent litigation in New York. So the customization factor to me was a big motivator to self-publish and put it on La Carta as well. So I think the, mo the more we can do uh, that goes beyond just the printed book and of course printed books are important, but you can print on demand very easily with any number 
of uh, publishers. It doesn't have to be Amazon. Uh, La Carta uses um, a third party that does this, and there are a lot of them out there that will print very cheaply. So someone in the Q and A asks, "How much is it?" So for the soft cover version of our book, which is about 900 pages, I think it's about $22. And for the hardcover version, it's about $40. And that's at cost. So the more, of course, that people use these platforms, these costs will come down over time and they have already. But you know, in 10 years or so, these print-on-demand books will be relatively inexpensive as the technology improves. Yeah, it's 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 uh, and everyone else goes around. If you could talk a little bit about the cost of your book, um, both the printed copy and also if you have an electronic copy, I think people will be interested in hearing that. Um, you know, I I remember one thing that that's kind of my my name the 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 name the per person that my gave the money for my um, professorship. His name is David L. Hammer. He's he's deceased now, um, but he was a, a really big Sherlock Holmes buff. And he couldn't find anyone to publish his book. So he started his own publisher in the 1980s. And so kind of thinking back to like, this is how you break and you kind of disrupt the market. Um, all right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about, and it's pretty, those of you who published with traditional publishers, it's very interesting. How has your experience self-publishing differed from publishing with a traditional publisher? And Peter, I, I think I'd especially like to hear from you because you've taken your book from a traditional publisher to a self-published model. How has your experience differed? Oh, well, uh, there were some surprises and bumps along the way, partly because we didn't abandon uh, a commercial model. We just essentially uh, sliced it down to what was a more balanced way of doing it. And so we also did this somewhat early in that we were in 2014, uh, ramping up. And at that time, Amazon had CreateSpace. Uh, a lot of people think that Amazon was doing it itself, but CreateSpace was another business that they brought in and it wasn't fully integrated. And then they had Kindle as a separate business. And there were just a lot of uh, challenges in terms of getting through their file inspectors and meeting all of those kinds of requirements. And, and so, you know, getting pretty good at Word, dealing with headers and gutters and all of that stuff was, you know, somewhat new and, and challenging. But once uh, the book was laid out, you know, to revise it year to year isn't, isn't nearly as much work. Another thing which was totally unexpected, we all use PDF. Well, it turns out there are different flavors of PDF. And if you use the standard version that will automatically apply when you PDF your documents. It produces something that's good for internet, uh, but it turns out it's not good for the publish, the printers that Amazon uses. And in fact, it produces a pixelated text. So one of the disasters, no, well, one of the things that happened in the first week the books were shipping is I got a call from a professor who said, hey, you know, the text isn't so sharp. And she, her eyesight was not great. And, and so, so I ended up spending several weeks trying to figure out what's going on. So you have to use what's called PDFX in order to have the right. So, you know, there are just a whole bunch of technical issues that uh, once you get sort of go down this path, you, you, you figure out. Uh, and then another really big challenge, uh, when I started this and agreed to do it, I thought it was just gonna be the setting of the tech, you know, compositing the books and doing that work. Uh, well, once professors started adopting it, uh, they would email me to say that we had to uh, be able to supply books to bookstores, that their law school required any books being used to be available in their bookstores. And there are still law schools that require that. And, and so all of a sudden, I was having to figure out how we could get books out to the bookstores in the quantities that they wanted. Uh, and just having to deal with Follett, Barnes and Noble and independent stores. And so, you know, I ended up spending time getting authorized vendor status and all of that. I don't inventory books. I order author copies through Amazon. They get shipped from Amazon. But even now, you know, six years into it, seven years into it, we still have, you know, problems where Amazon's truck didn't deliver the right quantity or, or things like that. So, that I, I would say is an unexpected aspect that I didn't really uh, want to take on, but, but I've gotten used to it 
and it does work reasonably well now. One of the things that's happened is that Amazon used to use UPS and USPS and FedEx. And now, as we all know, Amazon has taken over their shipping. And so that wasn't always a smooth uh, operation. So just a lot of kind of things. And partly because I'm uh, in part an economist, I was interested in those issues. I, I actually wanted to understand supply chain and think about that as part of just being involved with intellectual property and entrepreneurship. And so for me, it was interesting. I don't think Rob or Mark ever wanted to get involved with that and, and I've spared them, but, but yeah, it, it's a small business. It's like, you know, I teach my students about uh, music that, you know, a band is a, is a business that, you know, it's like a small law firm. And so just having all those pieces working, if we were just giving PDFs, uh, uh, distributing PDFs, a lot of that wouldn't be there. Uh, and I understand why my uh, co-panelists uh, are doing it in the way they're doing it. Uh, we had a large installed base of users and I think on net it's been worth it, but it was certainly a lot of hassle. Things are better now than they were seven years ago. Uh, Amazon is better. And uh, I would say a lot of these glitches are, are resolved, but it is, it's an interesting experience. Uh, if you're doing it, you know, as a, as a free or open source book, that's another uh, model. But I'll note that our price for our volume one is essentially the same price as what Ted quoted. You know, it's, you know, $26. So, you know, we're not charging a lot for that book. Uh, if you buy both books, you know, it's like $50. So, so it's, it's a relatively inexpensive proposition compared to $250. The other nice thing about breaking the survey book into two is that you don't have to carry around nearly as heavy a book. Uh, so for students who are carrying books, they can, you know, store one when they're using the other and things like that. And Peter, I don't know if this is a trade secret or not, but can you tell us about the volume of books that you uh, do with Inta? Uh, it's no. not a trade secret. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, uh, we do about 8,000 books a year across all of the different platforms. So that includes Kindle uh, and plus we have two books. So we have, we have over a hundred adopters and I deal with not all the books. A lot of, some adopters don't uh, stock the books in their bookstores. So I deal with about, about 60 bookstore uh, uh, sales a year. So th that, that's, the, that's the ballpark we're in. When we were with Walters Kluwer, Aspen, they used to give us some data on the relative size of the, of the, the size of the market. And you can, in some ways, do a back of the envelope calculation of how many people are in law schools. But as an IP, you know, when we started this book, IP was not really a subject that was taught. There was the Kitch and Perlman book, but there really wasn't a survey book. I think Paul Goldstein had a survey book, but it wasn't widely used. So we, we helped to, to seed that market. And, and so, you know, now I think, you know, maybe uh, 15 or 20% of law students, maybe 20% will take IP at our law school it will be 80% and, and probably at Stanford as well, you know, so, so, you know, it varies quite a bit, but, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting, uh, it's an interesting industrial organization story. Yeah. Wow. Um, Ted, let's. Uh, what are you, what are your thoughts on this? So, uh, so one in response to Peter, and then a few other things. So, so Peter, you make it sound like we don't have hardcover our, our printed books, but I think at least I know Lisa and Jonathan, and 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 our book is available in a printed copy, and ours is available both in hardcover and soft. Here's to Sarah. So I think we all are providing a printed copy. So I don't see any difference between what you're doing and what we're doing ultimately. Um, I, no, I, I knew, uh, my, my only point, uh, Ted, was that, that even with, I mean, the amount that we earn as a royalty is, is so modest per book that the pricing of our book is pretty close to the pricing of just printing the book. Uh, 
Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a little cheaper for ours, right? So our, because yours is just in soft cover. So I think our soft cover is $18 for about 850 pages. I, I don't know how many pages your book is, uh, but it sounds uh, like it's about twice, twice the price or something of the, of the free books. So we're talking right. about differences it's of not, tens it's, of it's dollars, less than or than a little less than hundreds twice. of dollars. Here. Yeah, but oh. it's it's not that much. But ultimately, I think people should be doing this at no cost. Um, we we write our articles at no cost. I didn't think it was a huge effort to put the book out. Um, at the end of the day, it took some work, but uh, but I think we're compensated pretty well otherwise. And I don't see much of a reason for professors to have to go out and make a ton of money off their books. Um, but that's me. I think the students are the ones suffering, not, not us. And we should try to benefit them as much as possible. But low cost is great, too. I mean, we're obviously comparing all of this to like $200, $180, $220 books, where, again, I mentioned the publishers provide very little value add relative to, to that additional amount. And to be certain, like, I'd like to hear from John, who's here on video, like, how much do you get from the publisher as an author? I mean, my understanding is it's like 20 to $30, $40 max. I mean, you can tell us too, Peter, of the $200 goes to the authors. There's no way they're providing that much value, right? No, Between... we, we received $15, not each, $15 total <laughs> per book. So we decided we would earn seven fifty per book uh, total for, you know, so that's why our book is, you know, $26. Sure. But no, I mean, I agree with you, but I also believe, I'll say it motivates me that, you know, we're creating a book, trying to make it, you know, because we all have our opportunity costs and, you know, sure. we were fortunate that our book, you know, got some following uh, you know, in the 90s, and we've been able to, you know, maintain that through and, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a lot of time to do some of these services. And I agree with you that we don't, we don't make money off of articles. But, you know, people make things on consulting other things, I would rather do my work, you know, in ways that I'm not zealously advocating someone else. I would rather, you know, yeah, I guess with 8,000 books, you can do it. I mean, for us, right, and for most of us, we're not selling enough books that it matters one way or the other. I can go do 10 hours of consulting and it's going to be more than I can make off the book. <laughs> so it's not something where I need to sit and concern myself with whether it's $15 or zero or whatnot. But sure, at 8,000 books or John, you're probably selling a lot, right? Duffy and Murgis and whatnot. It's, uh, it's just surprising to, to me. John now for a sec. Um, yeah, sure. I want I want to hear from John. And then I, I want to actually go on and talk a little bit more about the nuts, some of the nuts and bolts of how we've done this, uh, kind of how we've gone on about people gone about self publishing. So John, you had a, a few thoughts on this. Or so generally. yeah, so um, uh, Ted asked a specific question. And, uh, and and I do have my own question that I actually want to ask the self publisher um, group. Um, so first of all, I take all the criticisms of the traditional publishers uh, to heart because I think we, uh, meaning Rob and I, have had to deal with them and, 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 and we're not 100% pleased. Um, in terms of how much money we make, it, it is not something that terribly motivates us uh, to do. I think we, you know, we make uh, you know, I think in a good year, depending upon the new edition or something like that, I think we get like each 10,000 or something like that. And I don't even know what that breaks down to. Uh, maybe it's only 5,000, actually, maybe it's 10,000 and we have to split that. Um, but I, it's not a lot of money. Um, as, as Ted, as you said, you know, I also sometimes consult. Um, it's pretty, you know, the consulting, um, uh, you, you make that back in, in, in several hours. And I totally agree with you that we're extremely well compensated by our university, so we don't we don't need the money. The, the, this leads to the question that I want to ask the panel because if you say what's our motivator and why uh, why might we stick with traditional publishers? It's this question of impermanence. I think is the biggest question, uh, which goes to something that Jonathan and I were talking about in the first panel about you know getting you know having it be a book that's you know, judges will cite and maybe other scholars will cite and will be in libraries or be on other scholars' shelves. 
I mean, that's something Rob and I deeply do care about. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, all these things that you've talked about are great ways to get the students the books at a cheap price and get it fast. And I hear that entirely. What about that idea of, of, of having it available on people's bookshelves, other scholars' bookshelves, even people who haven't adopted it, um, as, as something that they can that they can use? And, and you know, do you think there that you are, are, are you seeing citations? Maybe for some of you, it's too soon after you publish, but are you seeing a lot of citations uh, to your book as, as, as sort of a scholarly book as opposed to just uh, teaching materials? So that's my question and I will uh, thank you for commenting on it and, and go mute. All right, Lisa. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's one of the main motivations that I had, I won't speak for Jonathan, um, uh, in writing it, not um, like, obviously not the financial incentive, but the reputational incentive of having this book out that has our take on patent law, and that's something that's going to be on people's shelves. Um, and, and we do have a physical book that you can put on your shelf. And it's, I, I think the fact that it is lower cost makes it more likely that it will end up on more people's shelves. And I, I think it's too soon to um, have a lot of citations yet, but I know there's been, um, like I, I know of innovation economists who have found our book useful for explaining the basics of patent law to them, so aren't law students, but uh, like those scholarly communities. Um, I have former students who I've uh, sent versions of it to who thought it was like more helpful to, as like in working through some issues in practice there. Um, a reporter on the federal circuit who, um, uh, like, trying to understand the patent issues there, thinks it's uh, incredibly helpful as a basic doctrinal um, explanation of that, and and all of those pieces of feedback I get from various sources, like that, to me, is the main motivation for me in um, writing it. I mean, in addition to having materials that I think are pedagogically valuable for my own students and teaching them. Ted, I'm going to go to you next. So I think uh, you make a really good point, John, though, about getting the books into libraries and onto people's shelves. And I've made this point to La Carta. Um, so I helped start the company. I, I don't do a ton with it anymore, but I still hop on a call like every few months and give my input. They have some other professor advisors and so forth. And I said, what you need to do is, is print these books to hardcover, get them an ISBN number, and sell them to libraries because that's what they know, right? Libraries have these sheets and they check the box and they buy it and stick it in there and so forth. And I do think that's important. And I think sending out the promotional copies and other things and maybe even to judges and so forth would be a great idea. And somebody needs to step up because Amazon doesn't do this, right? So La Carta could do it and, and get this um, pipeline essentially out so that these books can land on shelves um, at libraries and uh, uh, policymakers and judges and so forth. And I've been pushing this, but you have a point without that available, if you want the biggest right footprint, footprint for your book, publishers still make sense. So that's, that's something that we in the self-publishing world need to remedy, no doubt about it. Sarah. Yeah, so I, I think that's interesting too. I mean, I was I was thinking about it, and obviously, you know, I get free copies of all these all these books from publishers. Um, on the other hand, if if that's what the students are buying for their two hundred and fifty bucks, it just seems like the wrong way to do this, right? Like law schools can pay the thirty dollars for my book um, for their professors to to have copies in their libraries, and so there's. There's ways around it, but you're right. That's not. It, it doesn't get automatically sent. So, so I'm interested in, in in what Ted was saying about trying to find ways to remedy that, um, and and certainly, you know, trying to get it get it to judges as well. I, I don't think that that's something that would necessarily happen without without some effort. Um, law clerks, I don't think it's such an issue, right? Um, and I think that you know, as students come through who have used these materials and are familiar with. The fact that there's various free online materials that they can go to when they're starting research on an issue, um, that, that may be something that, that um, brings these up as, as sort of good, good starting points um, and good fundamental sources for, for 
important important pieces of patent law and brings it brings it to judges attention but you're right it would be nice it would be nice for the judges to have actual copies on their shelves so that's something to think about i don't think though that um any of us were would think wow i hope that this is only useful for students um right or only for practitioners um in fact you know i've i've been really happy that we've we've had a uh, um, a, a fairly good uh, Twitter presence where we've had a lot of, of interaction that way, um, and and it's had some good reach, and it's had good reach to practitioners. We've we've heard from a lot of people, um, and and I've heard from, like I said, from students um, in in other countries where the the prices of these case books mean it's just a non-starter. I mean, there's no chance, right? Um, but if you have if you have free online materials and and other ways to get them. That's a way to to get um, to to get our views of of patent law or our statements about you know fundamental pieces of patent law that everybody's going to want to cite just in the beginning of an article or whatever beginning of a brief. Um, that that yeah that's that's a way to disseminate it. So I mean I think there's pluses and minuses to it in terms of what people want. I mean sure everybody wants a great reputation right and, and wants everybody to to cite them as as the source on everything. Um, but I, I don't think that that motivates sort of everything I do as I get up and go about my day. So it's, uh, you know, it's it's in there. It's in the mix. Um, yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love for my name to to be mentioned in lots of briefs as, as we go forward. Um, I'm, I'm fine with that. I, I hope it happens. Yeah, it is a, a really important topic. Um, so two two thoughts that came to, to my mind as, as you're thinking about this. One is is um, my daughter's in, I have an eighth grade daughter who is in you know learning her classes and she has no textbooks. Her her teacher is assigned different materials, but like the idea of a textbook is just they don't really use textbooks anymore, which is so shocking to me, especially with this idea of of permanence of something that that you have that that's long term. Um, so I think that's really important. And the other thing that struck me is Peter was talking about owning textbooks rather than renting them. And I think that's really something that being like low price textbooks, you may actually be able to have that thing and keep it with you in the future. Whereas if you're renting a textbook, you, you might return it. Um, you might not have it. And so that might actually be a, a permanent feature or benefit of, um, of self-published textbooks. Um, why don't we uh, go ahead, Peter, uh, Jonathan, and then John, and then if we've got some time, we'll, we'll do a couple other topics. So, uh, so I want to highlight something that people might not have thought about, but uh, was referenced. So, getting the ISBN number is not that hard. I had, you know, I bought like a hundred of them when I started this publishing because I knew we would be doing multiple books a year. Uh, but that doesn't get you to libraries. And so this is something that I learned about uh, several years ago. Uh, the Google Oracle case was heating up and I wrote a monograph and I wanted that monograph to get published before the cert petitions. And now that I had this quasi publishing, I could do that. I could create a volume. And then I started to ask librarians, well, is this book gonna get into the permanence category? Is it gonna become, and it turns out that unless you're working with a major publisher, the library cataloging the way they access their books, you can't, you can't reach them. They will not look into that source material. So what I did, uh, it just so happened, I presented this uh, project uh, at, at, at Harvard and the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology offered to publish the entire monograph as an issue with commentaries. And that worked out great. And I've now used that model twice since uh, because these law journals will do these, these kind of symposium issues and they do achieve the permanence that John's talking about. But uh, it's not possible to create monographs in this way and get them adopted by all the law libraries. It, that's, and so it's a structural feature and I've, I've tried to talk with people in the library community about it, but you know their their norms and budgetary practices are not conducive to permanence of non of you know traditional publishing. 
just to jump in there, one thing that I know like our Lyle library traditionally would not even purchase textbooks. The, the way that textbooks would end up in our law library was that professors would donate their old review copies to the library. Now, I don't know if that's the norm everywhere else, but there may also be a resistance of law libraries to purchasing textbooks because they're in you know, part so expensive. Um, maybe that might be one piece of it. Jonathan? Thanks, Jason. Um, I guess I just think that there are three separate things going on here and that they're being conflated to a degree that doesn't make sense. So the first of them is permanence, the question of whether you have something that can sit on your shelf. I, I mean, I'll just note like throughout this discussion, we all sound so old, you know, our students these days, when they think permanent, they think a PDF as opposed to, you know, the TikTok version of the book that you can stream or whatever, which Lisa is actually working on for our book right now. Um, so like a PDF is, you know, infinitely permanent to them, but we're, okay, we're talking about, you know, the book on the shelf, like that you can do, whether you're self-publishing or going with a traditional publisher or anything else as, you know, the display behind Jason proves. So permanence and self-publishing are not, do not have to be in any way related. The second thing is reach, how many people, clerks, uh, you know, people in other law schools and other li law libraries are going to get access to your book. You know, there again, there doesn't necessarily need to be any correspondence between self-publishing and availability and reach. So at Lisa's initiative, we've gotten our book cataloged electronically in a whole bunch of law libraries with help from the Stanford Law Library uh, librarians. It's also available on Google Books. You know, they can download a copy on our website. My suspicion is that the reach that you're going to get from having easily available electronic copies going forward will dwarf the reach that you might get from having your book in physical form available in law libraries over the next decade or two because that nobody is going to interact with it in physical form anymore they're not going to check the book out unless they're using it for a class i mean not nobody but the number of people who will use it that way will be infinitely smaller than the number of people, whether they're law clerks or people at other schools or whatever, who are going to get at it electronically. And then the last thing is just sort of credentialing and will people treat your book as authoritative and will they cite it, which John has brought up a couple of times. And, and I guess this, this brings me to a point which I probably should have made in the first panel, which is that I do think that more and more the only value being provided by traditional publishers is this sort of credentialing function that maybe if you know, Aspen or Walters Kluwer or one of these publishers is choosing to publish your book, that's an imprimatur of reliability that will make people more likely to want to cite it or something like that. Um, or maybe seeing it in physical form will make them more likely to want to cite it, something like that. And I guess I have to say, like, I think, first of all, that's the only value we're getting out of publishers. That's ridiculous and can't possibly justify the value of traditional publishers. And secondly, like, I'm happy to go forward with, you know, the, the sort of reputation uh, and credentialing of our book resting on the fact that Lisa Larimore Wallet, uh, professor of law at Stanford Law School, is one of the co authors. Like, that's perfectly fine with me. And, you know, we'll see whether any, you know, what people think about that. And I think that that should be true for everyone. Like, you know, Manel, Murgis, and Lemley and Balganesh is going to be a great book that everyone believes in because of the four names on it, irrespective of what's in the book. Same for Ryak and, um, uh, Ryak and Burstein and Sawicki, and same for Duffy and Murgis and everything else. So, like, I think that this whole idea of, you know, whether we'll get cited, like maybe we will or maybe we won't, depending on whether the book is good or depending on what, as John says, whether people have a um, have a predilection against citing case books in the first place. But like, we don't need, I don't think we need the publishers for any of that stuff anymore either. All right, John, somehow I always end up with you with the last word. I'm not well, sure. Not always, that. but I, I just <laughs> think that, thanks, thanks for all the comments. I do think that there's three different things going on here uh, and, and three different models. And I, I, a lot of people made an analogy to law reviews. And I think that's a really great analogy uh, because there's three ways I think to publish your, your work in law reviews. And one is just put it up on SSRN. And that's Jonathan's, I think, argument that like, you know, if it's, if it's by Jonathan Mazur, we should just read his SSRN feed and not worry about whether it's published in, you know, Harvard, Yale, Chicago, wherever. Um, but none of us do that. Even though that's very easily accessible and it will be immediately available, none of us exclusively publish there. Um, and then there's the other poll, which is what Europe does. The European academics have to use Springer or something like that. And that is, I, I definitely think that model is bad. You have to give up your copyright. They're very hard to find. They're not electronically available. 
What we need is a sweet spot like the American law reviews. Forget about the peer review, not peer review, but the idea that they're actually cataloged. There's a, somebody who catalogs them. They're freely available. Um, those, I think, and there is some, you know, imprimatur that, you know, you got your article accepted at a really good review, you know, decent review. It's not just on your SSRN feed. Um, and there is a final version. It's not just like you can constantly tweak it. That would be the sweet spot, I think. But I, I don't, and, and I think we will get there, but I don't think we're there yet. Okay, I'm going to channel this, Ted. I know you got a comment, and you can make that comment in just a moment. I'm going to channel us then into copyright um, as our last topic. So, copyright. Uh, why did what what copyright license did you choose for your work? Why did you choose it, and how are you dealing with the copyright choices of others? So, um, I would like to go first on this topic, copyright. I'll I'll start. Uh... So we, we didn't make a conscious choice. I mean, copyright is automatic and we put a notice on our books and we, uh, we don't want people to pirate our books. And, and we do face piracy as an issue. I mean, our books do show up on platforms. Uh, Chinese students are not paying for a book and the book is, is available and there's not much we can do about that. Uh, but, you know, our goal is to try to channel people in the way Spotify does. We want people to, you know, feel that there's a fair price and you get a good service and, and this is, is a healthy balance. Uh, we give away chapters one and two uh, as a way to kind of help professors uh, ramp up early. And a professor says to me, well, I want to start with copyright. I authorize them to distribute uh, portions of the book, and all the professors get digital copies, PDFs, unprotected. Uh, so, you know, that, that's our, our, our general approach is to kind of make it uh, as a background part of it, but we're not, we're not uh, viewing this as, as, as a very closed model. We're just trying to, to, you know, channel people into what we hope is a fair market. Mm -hmm. Oh, and in terms of other works, I mean, we, when we first started publishing with the major publishers, they wanted us to license images from cases and things like that. And, and we did that early on. And it seemed silly to us. Uh, about five or six years in, we just said to them, we're not going to do that. This is fair use. And fair use has become, I would say, more supportive of our interpretation. And so we, you know, we we apply fair use when we're using images and materials from other sources. Uh, of course, we do edit cases. So that's a major part of our, our book, but we do a lot of text writing and, and such. Uh, so I'll turn things over to Lisa. Um, yeah, so, so we went with a Creative Commons license, the same one that um, Sarah mentioned earlier for the similar reasons. So it requires attribution on commercial use and no derivatives, where we went with the no derivatives one because we didn't want someone making and publicizing like their remix of the Major Ouellette uh, patent book. But as I said at the beginning, we have generally authorized derivative uses. So if an instructor wants to take the word version and have an edited version for their own personal, like for their class, um, that's fine with us. We've allowed people to do that this fall. Um, and, uh, and I think we did that to help maintain our own <laughs> control over the way that it's being used because we do think it's uh, like it's providing a valuable take on patent law. Um, in terms of dealing with copyrights of others, uh, I mean, most of the material is either created by us or government works. Actually, I'm curious, Peter, like who they were getting you to license case material from uh, for material that's in cases. But uh, so we, we have some material that are the problems I talked about in the first panel that were created by others. And for that, we got their permission and, and we attribute those problems to them. But mostly it's um, our own work or government works. Yeah, just to clarify, not the, not the federal government works. It's just that, you know, we wanted to have the Saul Steinberg uh, cover. And we, we actually did get a license early on and we just haven't gone back after some points, but no, just mostly images. Sarah. 
Yeah, so I don't I don't think I have a lot to add. I think we made a lot of the the same choices as, as Lisa and Jonathan for for a lot of the same reasons. Um, and and you know the the things we use are mostly from patents or cases or things like that. Um, and one thing I did want to say though that probably belonged somewhere else in this whole panel, but uh, since we were doing this and creating our own PDFs, we were able to make all of our images um, accessible so that uh, you know so that there's descriptions of what all the images are and that and that um, those could be read. And so that was a nice thing to be able to do really easily, um, just because we had control of of everything we were doing basically. So that was that was just one choice that that I had meant to mention earlier at some point. Thank you. And Ted. I guess we're down to the last 30 seconds. So maybe I'll have the last word instead of John, but <laughs> John, maybe you can get five seconds in. Um, so we didn't go, I mentioned with Creative Commons, um, we're happy for anyone to remix our work however they want, uh, as long as there's attribution. And I would hope other authors go that route. I, I find it a bit odd that in the IP community, there's a huge push for everyone else to go open source. But when we when it comes to our own materials, there I think ours is the only book that's truly open source. In fact, if you look at some of the other books out there in the IP world that purport to be open source, um, they're only available as PDF downloads or, and whatnot, or with the permission of, of the author. So that, that's not open source, that's a licensing model. Um, which is which is fine and and supports some of the theories I've written about, but I think when again you're compensated more than well enough uh, for what you're doing, it would be great to make that material as easily accessible as possible, as long as there's attribution and you can put into your license something about you know distorting right the nature of the work and so forth uh, to minimize the amount of of mis right use of the work, but I think locking it up in a sense uh, with these Creative Commons license, which is, are supposed to motivate reuse, which ultimately don't, is, is not the way we should go as a community. So we have three very different models. We have a model of commercialization. We have a model of licensing, kind of open access, but no derivative works. And we have a model of completely open access. So three really, really different models. Um, I'd like to take, thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, thank the panelists for participating. Really appreciate all of you taking some time on your Friday afternoon to talk about patent law case books, which is uh, and a topic that I'm super interested in. Um, and you guys might be as well, but uh, maybe not everyone else in the world. Um, so I'd like to thank our remarkable panelists and thank all of you for joining us today. Um, I'd also just like to take a moment to um, to encourage you to think about joining our next program on Monday, November 8th, um, 12.45 p.m. Central Time, when we'll host uh, Anjali Vats, who will give a talk entitled The Myth of Race Neutrality and in Intellectual Property Law. So I, I hope to see you all then. And again, thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Thank you.